Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Earthly Headlines. Today we're going to explore some of the various reasons humans lost their fur. A lot of people have had their speculations, a lot of scientists, they don't really, they can't really pinpoint exactly why, but instead there are different biologists who have their theories and some are more compelling than others. But I think it's a pretty interesting topic just to talk about, spend an episode talking about. So this Smithsonian article came out a couple, I think about a week and a half ago, and the headline reads, Why Did Humans Lose Their Fur? Along with Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalus, based on this recreation right here, they also lost their fur and kept it in patches in various places. Like some people have beards, some people still have, you know, they have, everyone has hair at one point in their life on their head. And unless barring some, uh, you know, some weird genetic condition or something like that. And in the pubic region and on the arms, people have various, some people, I've met some people who are completely hairless everywhere, uh, naturally. And then some people who are just like a doppelganger for a caveman or something like, like the stereotypical caveman. So People vary, but where it is normally universal is most people are hairless in the face, aside from beards, um, the palms of the hands, bottoms of your feet, and underneath the wrists as well. For the most part, everyone, or ge- virtually almost everybody is hairless there. Along some of these uh, reasons why we have or we don't have hair and these parts have to do with the environment most of the time. Um, Although there is one really compelling reason that I'll go over in a second or in a few minutes. One is whether we adapted to semi-aquatic environments. Um, The other one is uh, sweating to sweat better, along with more sweat glands to help us keep cool while hunting uh, during the day. Another reason was uh, we lost our fur to allow us to read each other's emotional responses. Before we get into each of those, and some of those are... Some, some carry uh, more weight than others, some of those theories, but um, going over them, I think, is beneficial just because we can kind of weed out some of the nonsense ones and take some of the good ones and apply it to the path toward the truth. We'll look at why, chemically speaking, and um, the physical reasons why people lose hair. We have this area that I mentioned earlier called the plantar skin, so under... Uh, your palms of your feet or, or bottoms of your feet, palms of your hands, etc. This area is, is rich in a protein, in, uh, an inhibitor protein called DKK2, which is not present in high levels in those spots, in those hairless spots. So what it does is it blocks this, this signaling pathway called WNT, which controls hair growth. So some bald people, they'll have this, they'll have this uh, protein inhibitor in spots where they can't grow hair. DKK2 is not the end-all, be-all inhibitor protein that, can, that blocks uh, WNT, the WNT pathway, but then there are, there are a few others, and it's just a big piece of the, of the hairless formula. It's not the, it's not the only reason. Uh, D- this is a quote from the uh, from the doctor. Uh, what's her name? Millar. She says DKK2 is enough to prevent hair from growing, but not to get rid of all control mechanisms. So there's a lot more to look at. So it's just one piece of the puzzle. Understanding how this inhibitor system works could help in research of other skin conditions like psoriasis and vitiligo, which is an interesting connection. So yeah, basically, that's the physical reason why uh, people lose hair is because an, an inhibitor gets introduced to the body either for various number of reasons, fitness reasons, maybe someone inherited some genetic mutation. It, there's a lot of different reasons uh, why people, more people, some people have more concentrations of DKK2, the hair growing inhibitor, or one of the hair growing inhibitors than other people do. So let's go back to uh, the aquatic ape theory. So this hypothesis suggests human ancestors lived on the savannas of Africa, uh, hunting and gathering as they do. And then during the dry season, they would move to lakes and basic, uh, oases or other bodies of water and wade through the water and collecting tubers, shellfish, and other food sources. And then we lost our fur, which was, develop- which was later replaced by a layer of fat 
and it might have helped us develop bipedalism as well because of wading through the shallow, shallow water, but this idea is not taken that seriously. Um, I've heard this idea too. I mean, it carries a little bit of weight, but I don't think that was the driving factor uh, as to why we lost our hair. I think it gets more, it gets a lot more deeper than that. Because this is this describes simply just simply um, an act, a physical act that we te- that a group of us tended to do during a, ter- a certain period of time when the climate would turn dry. I don't know if that's enough of a driving force for our body to change. It might have been again a lot of this. A big theme of this topic is bits and pieces. So. Uh, there are a lot of contributing factors. There's not just one smoking gun, but it's like a conglomeration of a bunch of different factors that pushes our body toward becoming hairless and bipedal. So a, a lot of, um, again, that might be a reason, the aquatic ape theory. It might Again, it's not the reason, though. There's another uh, theory, though, that when the forests receded into the savanna, people had to develop a new method of thermoregulation, which is uh, body uh, maintaining the optimal body uh, temperature. So losing that fur makes more sense because it made it possible for us to hunt when it got hot and prevent us from overheating. And this coincided with an increase in sweat glands, which kept us even more cool. And later on, when we discovered fire and clothing, it just sort of reinforced this um it kind of reinforced this unnecessary fur from gro- growing uh our bo- our body didn't need it anymore uh because we had other ways to warm ourselves when it got cold when it got hot we could just remove the articles of clothing and then sweat and then we'd be good furless also going furless uh also reduce the impact of lice and other parasites so when you're selecting a mate you could see their bare skin and you could see that, oh, this person doesn't have lice. Okay, that's you can check one off the list as a, a more attractive mate. So the person's tall and hairless, perfect, uh, let's get it on. So it became a potent advertisement of a healthy parasite-free mate. Um, that's definitely a sexual, the sexual selection, so to speak, is definitely a strong uh, pusher toward that. I guess that genetic direction of going hairless again, more TKK2, more other uh, hair inhibitor, uh, protein inhibitors. But here's the most interesting part of the article, and it has to do with the person's eyes. So losing hair on the face and other parts of the body opened up this emotional communication uh, channel of evolution, uh, of evolutionary opportunity, essentially, because... Uh, many animals in the wild, they have two. Ty- they only have two types of cones, which, if you guys don't know, cones uh, are receptors in the eye that catch and detect color. And he- in humans, we have three. So our third cone gives us more power, so to speak, to detect hues in the middle of the spectrum, meaning we- we're good at detecting different shades of red, for example, or different shades of blue. And it seems that ability seems unnecessary just strictly for hunting or tracking so um, the argument uh, that we have three cones mainly for better hunting it doesn't carry as much weight as because of the third cone's ability uh, to detect differentiate between this shade of red and that shade of red or this shade of blue and that shade of blue Um, that doesn't really help you when you're hunting because when you're hunting you just want to detect movement for the most part and distance and depth per- perception and stuff, which comes from having two eyes in the front. Chungizi, he's a, he's a doctor uh, that is proposing this theory. He proposes that the third cone allows us to communicate non-verbally by observing color changes in the face. So our eyes become sensitive to the oxygenization of hemoglobin under the skin. So we could understand when someone's uh, embarrassed when they blush or um, when we look at a baby, if it looks a little green or a little bit blue, they might be sick. Uh, we can detect sexual attraction, again, through uh, a different type of blush, blushing, right? Or when someone's really red, they might be angry. So all of these emotional states we're able to detect because of this third cone. And if humans lost their fur, we'd be able to uh, better catch on to these cues. And ergo, better communication, better chance for survival etc so that i don't know if that was the driving factor again but it seems like a really good reason 
uh, backed with a lot of science. And even further, in 2006, Changizi uh, published a paper that primates with bare faces and bare asses, they tended to have three cones like humans as well. Whereas the fuzzy face monkeys, they only have two cones. So uh, according to the paper anyway, the hairless fac uh, faces and color of vision seem to run together. They seem to uh, be strongly correlated, which, if, I mean, if they see it in monkeys, that seems pretty, that's that, so to speak, right? That seems pretty open and shut that three cones in primates anyway and in humans seem to co correlate with uh, the, how bare the skin is, which makes a lot of sense. There's nothing else in nature that uh, changes color like that based on emotion, especially. That seems to be unique to primates. Although lizards and birds have three cones as well, but their third cone is different from ours because it, it's better suited to detect different colors on the spectrum, whereas ours were more in the center. So let me know what you guys think. Do you, are there any other reasons that I haven't gone over? I think this is a pretty interesting article just to understand uh, not even not even evolution, but just the reason why things play out the way they do in terms of development. So it's kind of like a battery. So someone's eyes have three cones. So that's one separate part of the human anatomy to better to de detect someone someone else's emotional response a different biological entity with changing skin color which is a different part of the body that also develops so the, you, we have this weird co-relationship going on this biological relationship amongst people of individuals within our own species and we kind of developed in this co-relation correlated co-relationship so to speak i think that's what i got most from this article was the fact that the, these processes that are completely under our noses we don't even we can't notice it from on a day to day but over a long period you, we can kind of in with the gift of hindsight so to speak we can look back on our ancestors and see oh this was developed over a long period of time and i think just being aware acutely aware of something like this makes looking at other other arche archaeological headlines other events and discoveries in science it in the long run i think it helps us build this foundational knowledge of what's possible, especially with the human body. So let me know what you guys think in the comments and I'll talk to you guys later.